Hello and welcome to ABP Education. My name is Prabhji and uh, I would like to welcome you all to the next webinar in the Campus to Career series. And uh, before talking about the webinar today, I'd like to introduce you to you abpeducation.com. abpeducation.com is a recently released news portal from the Ananda Bazaar Patrika group and it is powered by the Telegraph Online and anandabazaar.com. And uh, everything that happens in the world of higher education is found here including the exams uh, related results uh, related issues and everything that uh, you know goes on in the world of higher education and uh, now talking about the campus to career series uh, the campus to career series started on august 12th uh, with the bengal education leaders summit and it was attended by the state education minister mr partho chatch digital marketing, how to brand and boost the business. Now introducing the panelists today. First on the panel is Mr. Vikas Chavla, digital leader and angel investor. Mr. Chavla is the co-founder of an ed tech venture focused on digital marketing and social media, India's fastest growing independent marketing solutions firm. Next on the panel is Mr. Senior Director at Daily Hunt. He has worked across multiple industries, including media, telecom, mobile applications, and has focused on marketing, driving insights and analytics, and product service launches. Next on the panel is Mr. Atanu Ghosh, Managing Partner, Blue Week Solution. Mr. Ghosh has been involved in education, research, consulting, and training in the digital transformation domain. He is the founder of Salt and Soap, an e-commerce technology and analytics platform. Next on the panel is Mr. Abhishek Mukherjee, formerly with Ola, Mintra, Unilever. He has spent 15 years working in the FMCG industry, data science consulting, and e-commerce sectors. And now introducing our moderator, Mr. Nandan Sengupta, College Ambassador for India, Cambridge Marketing College, Cambridge. After spending the, the early part of his career in B2B technology, solution marketing, and project management, Mr. Singh Gupta moved on to become a consultant with special focus on strategic issues and digital marketing. He comes with around 30 years of experience. And, uh, Mr. Singh Gupta, now I hand over the session to you. Have a great one. Thank you. And uh, a very hearty welcome to all the panelists and the attendees. Thank you, ABP Education, for organizing this. Now, to start with, my job is just to set up the stage as to what digital marketing is all about and how we can go forward today um, to let the attendees have a brilliant understanding about the whole genre. Now, while doing that, I would like to tell you that this Digital marketing, as we call it, is basically marketing, marketing management as it was in the classical time, uh, even 20 years back or 30 years back. The principles are still there, but the execution and implementation have changed immensely. So for digital marketing, we have I should say three different layers. There are many sub layers, but I'll just say um, that these are the three main layers. One is you can look at digital marketing from the perspective of a company, a brand, and how they should be able to use digital marketing technologies and capability to reach out to their customer is one challenge. And in that area, uh, we have a problem because of uh, because because of the lack of a proper training knowledge and the lack of trained professionals in our country which are, i i wouldn't say that there are no professionals there are but we need many more by 2025 according to many reports from world bank and companies like kpmg and stuff so one perspective is from brand the other perspective is from uh, the career seeker those who want to get into digital marketing 
how do they get into it? Uh, now, there are a lot of confusions uh, because we, when we hear about digital marketing, we generally think about a very few keywords, which we know that is website, search engine optimization, and so on and so forth. But mark, digital marketing is uh, much more than that. So in the career seekers, there are two levels. One is who, who, who can really do the marketing hands-on, who would be more concentrating on the marketing operations and the strategic issues. And there is a back-end um, area as well, where the technicalities are being handled. I am sure our panelists will explain the things from their perspective in a much more detail. So I should say front end and back end. Now to be able to get into those type of careers, there are plenty of ways. Um, it could be through management training, it could be through engineering training, it could be through mathematics, or even it could be through um, social sciences and humanities. There are ways, there are requirement of such people in digital marketing as well. We'll talk about that later. Now, when we talk about digital marketing, why is it different, any different from um, the classical marketing? Because, because, because our lifestyle has changed and we are not in just buses and trams and households, but we are on our devices. We are on mobiles, we are on platforms, we are on uh, you know, on laptops, desktops, apps, Snapchat, social media, so on and so forth. And every time we do that, we actually generate some sort of data. When in the morning, you, all of you wake up and first check your uh, WhatsApp message, you start creating data. So the digital marketers who are actually monitoring you through your phones and through your, not you, rather, you know, your phone or uh, the website that you're going through, they start getting to know you better and better. And these data are captured, analyzed, and insights are generated on which the digital marketers actually develop their strategies and actions, and based on which, the customers, the potential customers can be targeted much more efficiently, much more uh, in, in a much more focused way. Now, when I say targeted, don't think it in a bad way. It, it's not aiming for shooting someone. It's just trying to reach out to someone and tell them about the products and everything. So this is, um, this is, basically the background of the marketing and in the marketing there are lots of uh, sorry digital marketing there are lots of other uh, verticals like uh, strategy like uh, analysis like insights like um, technical uh, development clouds and so on and so forth we we are going to listen to those things from our esteemed panelists so with this particular um, setup I would like to get into the discussions and we, we would call our panelists one after the other and then probably we'll get into the discussion. But before that, I think ABP would like to uh, have a particular video run and that is why I will hand it over to Anchel. Anchel, over to you.
Are uh, you on mute, uh, Dr. Sengupta? Yep. Yep. Uh, I, I, I suppose um, it's over and we can go on. So I would request our first panelist, uh, Vikash. Uh, Vikash, would you like to take the stage and take, take the mic rather than the stage in the webinar? And uh, carry on, please. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sengupta. And big thank you to ABP Education for having us, uh, having me and all of us over here today. So I think I'll, I'll quickly share some insights from what, what we've seen from the digital space. Uh, and the way we look at it, we've been in the digital space for almost 10 years now. And while it's been exciting over the last 10 years, what we've realized is just over 40% of India or Indians actually have access to the internet even today, right? Just over about 55 crore internet users, which is roughly 42% of the, of the population as per the census. So that means actually almost 60% of the, of the population is going to get access to, to data, to internet, to digital, to all the apps that all of us enjoy over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And for us, that's, that's even more exciting. Right? That means there is so much more growth left. There is so much more opportunity left. And there is so much more that we're going to see in terms of innovation, in terms of you know, homegrown uh, solutions, homegrown apps, homegrown you know, experiences that, that Indians can, can actually have. And that's really going to be amazing to see over the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years. The other part we've, we've also actively seen is that, uh, you know, owing to COVID, a lot of things have migrated to being online in some form. Obviously, in the future, there will be, obviously, the physical world as well. You will have physical sessions like this. But at the same time, online and digital is going to play a huge role in all aspects of life. And we've seen, you know, industries like health tech, uh, education, of course, and ed tech, uh, also entire e-commerce and the entire retailing experience, right? Buying any product has now become an online experience or an omni-channel experience where you can buy from wherever you want. You can buy from retail store if you want, but at the same time, you can also buy it online. So COVID has really accelerated digital adoption across. And that also means that all of us uh, as students and <clears throat> as, as people who are going to look at a career, uh, marketing and, and of course digital marketing can become a huge opportunity to actually scale up. So those will be the two points. I think one is that, you know, 60% of India is going to get access to internet over the next 10 years. And second, that COVID has really accelerated all of this. And that's really why we are still excited to be in the space that, that we are. Over to you. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, right. No, um, uh, that's great. Uh, before we go ahead with our other panelists, there is just one question. Um, I know you are, you are, you, you have been working on um, consulting to your clients on digital marketing. So I'm just putting this question to you. Uh, Kosa of Chakravarti is asking: Is affiliate marketing a part of digital marketing, or it's completely different from it? Would you like to answer that? Absolutely. I think uh, affiliate marketing is indeed a part of digital. Uh, it's nothing but, you know, companies and partners who actually have audiences, who have visitors that come to their, their websites, apps, and others, and they find a way to, to leverage that audience to advertise to them, right? It's, it's similar to how when you, when you go into the ABP website or, or app and you see some advertisements there, it's a similar form. It's just that uh, it's run through partners and affiliates who have a longer tail of websites, apps, and other publications that that really makes sense. So it is very much, uh, very much part of it. Great. Um, thank you, Vikash. Thank you very much for um, giving us a very, you know, enlightened view into that field. We will come back to you later, probably. So um, I would rather now uh, like to go to Atanu. Atanu. Uh, would you like to take the mic and you know talk about the things that you you are working on right now? Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Nandanda, and thank you, ABP Education for uh, inviting us. It's, uh, I can see there's a lot of enthusiasm. Already more than 150 participants, a lot of questions. Uh, I would uh, probably take a few minutes to discuss uh, three things. One is I want to define digital marketing a little bit because 
uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, a lot of confusion around what exactly is meant by digital marketing and what is a part of digital marketing and what is not uh, because you know some people think even television is digital because technically it is digital it is uh, it is today we have digital television so uh, any any marketing that is done on television is also digital marketing or if you have a digital uh, display board that also is digital technically because this is digital technology so do we consider that as digital marketing or somebody asked social media marketing whether that is digital marketing so what exactly is the gambit of digital marketing the second thing that i'll talk about is uh, the uh, why are why are brands getting into a digital space what is the fundamental reason for that and then third is uh, uh, i'd like to uh, focus a little bit on what are the different types of carriers that are there in digital marketing, especially given the fact what I understand is a large part of today's audience are actually students who are probably uh, looking at a career in digital marketing. So let me start with the first one, uh, the gambit of digital marketing. Now, uh, what is popularly understood in most of the cases are digital marketing is digital advertising. Okay, that means basically marketing communication through uh, various forms of digital media, whether it is search, whether it's display or it's social media. So these are the various ways or affiliates. So these are the various ways of communicating about your product and services uh, through the digital, uh, digital media. That's what is commonly understood as digital marketing. But actually digital marketing is uh, all the gamuts of marketing which have been disrupted or which has been transformed rather through digital technology. So if we actually go by the classical four P's of marketing, uh, there, there'll be all these four P's that have got disrupted in some way or transformed rather in some way. Uh, if we look at the product, we have now digital products instead of physical products, let's say music or a, a, a photo, uh, even this education delivery that has, what was a physical product that has actually become a digital product. So wherever there's a digitization of physical products, we can see that there is, that, that's where one part of the classical marketing is transformed through digital technology and obviously i mean uh, digital when you talk about digitization of physical products there's a huge impact on disruption uh, and transformation because it uh, completely changes the cost structure for product so that's uh, that's the first p the second p is uh, uh, price so we we all know that uh, how dynamic pricing so you know, previously, let's say when we used to take yellow caps, uh, you, you, the yellow caps don't, don't have different prices for different points of time in the day, because they will run on a meter and the meter is uh, is a standard meter. So whether it's in the morning, in the rush hours or in, in the afternoon, it will be the same price. Okay, unless, of course, it's charging a premium out of the way. But now that is that is actually become uh, uh, legitimized and we know there are concept of surge pricing and there is uh, entire area of algorithmic pricing, which uh, which has made the entire pricing very dynamic. So that's the second P of marketing, which has actually got disrupted by uh, digital technologies. The third P of marketing is the uh, place, and uh, the best example, of course, is e-commerce, where uh, the uh, the place where you place the order, where you pay. So the entire cycle of placing an order, the way where you pay and where you possess the goods, the entire cycle uh, has has uh, got uh, transformed because of digital technology and finally the promotion which is which is typically understood as digital marketing that is the digital advertising which anyway has got transformed because of all the different tools that we see uh, search social uh, uh, display and all of those things uh, so uh, so th this is the entire gamut of so when we talk about digital marketing it is actually this digital technology that is transforming the entire aspects of marketing in a way uh, now coming to why brands are uh, so much getting into digital so the reason is that uh, intuitively all, we all know the reason that people are on digital media the, the number of uh, digital media, you know the mobile phones etc are increasing so all those things are fine but fundamentally what is happening is that if you look at the entire customer journey right from a discovery to a research to let's say a, uh, ordering purchase pay and finally advocacy the entire part of customer journey today has become largely digital 
So when you are looking for search, let's say all the all the platforms that have transformed, uh, if we talk about Airbnb or if we talk about Amazon, it is essentially uh, transformed our search process. The value addition of these platforms essentially is uh, it facilitates the search process. So today, if I am a let's say a small hotel, a budget hotel or even a budget guest house, I actually would look forward to a platform that enables the discovery. Okay, so it is very difficult for people to discover my uh, hotel or my guest house unless I am in a platform like an Airbnb or a Uber. So similarly, uh, sorry, uh, uh, oil. On the other hand, let's say if I am a small uh, retailer then it's very difficult to uh, get myself discovered uh, unless I, I am on a platform like an Amazon or a Flipkart. So this entire process of discovery, the process of research. Okay. So today, uh, the research obviously is happening online because previously when, if somebody has to decide whether uh, uh, somebody will buy my product or not, if I'm a seller, uh, probably will uh, do a reference check with few friends and uh, family members who have purchased with me before. And that's the only research that, they, that he or she can do. But today the research is totally uh, you know, open and public. I, I will get into the reviews and of course, I mean, the genuineness of reviews is a different question, but that's a different challenge that you have to uh, uh, resolve. But overall, my ability to research has increased because of the digital media. So ordering, paying and possessing, of course, it's a physical product that you don't, uh, possessing has to be physical. But again, where the products are digital, like a music or an entertainment or an education, to the education is getting disrupted. All these are digital, becoming digital products. Now the possession also has become digital. So once the possession becomes digital, your entire distribution channel gets disrupted. Okay, for example, what has happened, let's say, in the media industry. So your entire distribution channel is now, uh, a newspaper distribution channel uh, is, is getting disrupted because your digital channel requires a completely different form of distribution compared to a physical channel. So, and, and then of course, the advocacy or the experience that how, how does our customer say that whether a product is good or bad. So that again has gone to a digital platform. So if you look at the entire cycle, entire chain, uh, then the customer experience has totally transformed. And that's why it has become mandatory for brands to be in the digital platform. Because otherwise, I, if I have, to, I have to be in touch with the customer end to end, right from its discovery to the advocacy stage, then I, I, unless I am, I, I am available in the digital platform, I will not be able to get the mind share of the brand. Uh, and, and that's why we're talking about things like micro moments where every instance when a customer is looking for a product, I should be present. I should be able to get those signals when a customer is looking for a particular product. So that's where, that's the reason fundamentally why brands have to be on the digital platform. Uh, coming to my last part where uh, as far as a career and other opportunities are concerned. Uh, see, uh, one thing, uh, especially for the students, I think some questions have already come in. Digital uh, marketing as a career is not one skill. This is something that fundamentally needs to be understood. It is not one skill. It is a combination of skills and there are complementary skills, but, but if you have to specialize, you have to decide what type of skill you need to, or you, you want to specialize on depending on your interest and aptitude. So on one hand, you have, let's say, uh, creative content, uh, you know, uh, making digital content. So that's one part of the skills. If you're interested in, let's say, content building, uh, digital content writing, uh, that's, if that's your forte, uh, that's one area of specialization. On the other side of the spectrum, you have deep analytics, deep analytics and AI, which is very, very different from, let's say, writing, a, uh, you know, creative content. So uh, if, if you want to be in that area where you are uh, I think not in the scope about data and all, because ultimately the data is what is feeding into your digital communication. If you want to work on data, if you want to work on analytics, then obviously uh, you, you, you are looking at a career which is more related to statistics, maths, and uh, algorithms. And, and in between, you also have to, uh, if you are comfortable in using tools and techniques, uh, then uh, there are various types of uh, you know, tools like Google Ads, Facebook, and various others where you have to get proficiency in. And of course, there's marketing. As Nandanda rightly said, that marketing is, 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 the, is the foundation. So digital marketing is built on the foundations of marketing. So if you have to build a digital marketing strategy, 
you have to understand the foundations of marketing strategy. So depending on your interest, you have to choose the specialized. So typically what happens is that most of the institutes which offer digital marketing courses, will probably have a, a few courses which are common, okay, where you build these basic uh, skills in all these uh, aspects. And then you start specializing. You, if you if you're a content guy, if you're a creative guy, probably you get into that specialization. If you're a data guy, you get in, get, uh, you get into some other specialization. If you're a technical guy, so there's also a, a programming and a technical part of it where you have to build various softwares, APIs, etc. cetera, to, to, uh, with the tools and also if you're a technical guy, then you go into that line. So digital marketing has, I think, uh, space for everybody. So whichever, whichever uh, discipline you are in, whether you are in liberal arts or you are in uh, a total techie guy or you are in you know, statistics, maths kind of guy, uh, there, there, is, there is space for everybody. Only thing is that you have to choose your right specialization as part of your interest. So uh, uh, I thought I'll share this with you and uh, over to Nandinda. Atanu, thank you very much. Um, there are certain, you know, quite a few number of questions which we'll take later. And um, right now you are going to um, go to Abhishek. So um, Abhishek, uh, now when Atanu has uh, brought in the whole picture, he has talked about the disruption, the, the changes, the transformation in the business, the different uh, ability for uh, the people to come into the digital marketing gamut. So on that basis, uh, may I request you to, to uh, value add from your experience as well, because you, know, you have worked in a very real scenario, which is service oriented as I suppose, and how, how that is um, going to enrich the attendees knowledge is that what we are looking for now. Over to you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sengupta. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you to the other panelists who already spoken uh, for setting the context. So yeah, I mean, in my 15 years of uh, being a marketer, working across companies like Unilever, Britannia, Mintra, and Ola, um, obviously I have been fortunate to see the evolution and be an active participant of the evolution of digital marketing. So my first comments would be clearly there's disruption. The way we used to build brands 15 years ago and how we build brands today are very different. 15 years ago, it would probably just be uh, based on a lot of intuitive research that we would do, uh, respondent-based research, understanding uh, problem statements, uh, segmenting your audience, targeting, positioning, building a brand strategy, working with ad agencies. You launch a brand, you launch a product following the four Ps. And then you wait for feedback. You know, you would wait typically any FMCG product you launch and you wait for feedback for two months, three months, sometimes even six months. Today, feedback happens live. Your brand is live 24 by 7, 365 days. You as a marketer are getting feedback live. Whether it is a Nike, whether it is an Ola, whether it is any brand you mention, whether you sell online, offline does not matter. People have a right to comment on your brand live and hence as a marketer you're getting feedback live you have to build the right infrastructure to work on that feedback and hence continuously be on your toes so that's the one great thing we have learned that disruption is here to stay and i also agree with uh, mr atanu uh, it has scope for everyone uh, for the students who are on this uh, uh, discussion uh, the most heartening thing I would like to tell you is today, if you look at YouTube, there are people uh, such as Bhuvan Bam. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of him. There are many more influencers on Instagram and many other platforms who have uh, a good mix of genuine and also harvested followers. But they are a brand by themselves. I mean, they have a platform, they have a channel, they have an audience, and then somebody asked about affiliate marketing, brands want to work with them to sell their products because there's no one size uh, fits all approach anymore. Every, every category, every segment is getting sliced and diced into far, far smaller niche segments. Even in FMCG today, there are brands that are getting launched as we speak in a, what we call digital first mode where these will not be available in physical stores. They will only be available online where the cost of launch is hence much lower, the agility of the brands is much more. 
uh, the company I worked at, Ola, ourselves, we are actually what a taxi company, but we don't own any taxis. But we are able to operate all over India and now even in London and many parts of the world because we've built great platforms where we can aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and we use digital channels to reach out to people, knowing exactly when they need the product and making it available through an app. So understanding of the consumer life cycle again, which was spoken about, is again getting far more slice, you're getting much more richness of data. So I'll summarize by saying that uh, along with the four P's now, there is, in my opinion, four stages of a brand or any campaign or digital marketing. There is the insight stage, there's the management stage, there's a the creative stage, and then there's a the measure stage. Uh, and hence the kind of professional that each of these stages need. The insight stage needs a good mix of people from a market research brand, and a good mix of social sciences understanding, which is to look beyond the data and understand consumer insights. Because consumers at the end of the day are typically uh, solving for their problems and seeking solutions from brands. So how do you decipher insights is a very interesting field of work where you have to use a mix of uh, social sciences and data sciences to understand insight. Then there's pure management, which a lot of MBAs are very good at. Uh, uh, where a BBA, MBA degree works very well, where you manage uh, resources, you manage a business, you manage a PNL, and you manage a brand, you manage its uh, top line, bottom line, all of that. So that's pure management. Then there's creative, which is again a very interesting space where earlier you had people, uh, again from the arts, uh, people who have a very good grasp of uh, creative, uh, such as art, such as uh, movie making such as uh, graphic design and so on who today are using a digital platform to enhance their creativity so that creative side will further get enhanced as digital marketing grows which will again throw up many many interesting career opportunities as we already seen so right from animation to voiceover to all kinds of creative uh, people uh, will get a huge platform to showcase their talent on the entire side of uh, creative and then finally the measurement side which we've already spoken about enough that so much data getting generated the hardcore engineering uh, and analytical bent of mind people they'll be building great algorithms great platforms to be deciphering the insight and the data so that's how the cycle will go on and hence i think what really I would like to conclude by saying is you have to be very good at one thing that you genuinely have a talent in, right? Rather than trying to be a jack of all, like they always said, you have to be a master of one thing in digital marketing as a student. You have to understand where is it that you have that unique talent? Is it in the creative side? Is it in the insight? Is the management? Is it in analytics? And then you have to go much deep into it because today the world is all about specialization. So you, you have to pick up your field, go very deep, you have to use a mix of classical education, which is your classroom and typical degree certification and new age education, which is completely online and get on job training, coaching uh, certification to keep enhancing your skills. Because the other thing that we are seeing a lot because of digital marketing is skill enhancement and on the job learning is very important. So that's how I would like to conclude in terms of because of what we are seeing in the business side, what I would uh, recommend and advice to students and other professionals in the field in terms of uh, being relevant to uh, the entire ecosystem of digital marketing. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, thank you, Abhishek. Uh, it's 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 really nice because you know um, you have very nicely accumulated this um, this different phases in the whole management process, like insight acquiring management, creative implementation, and all these. And at each level, there are different skills required for which different kinds of students, different kind of graduates could come into the whole show. As Atanu was saying, it's a, it's a collection of skills that we need in the digital world. So thank you very much. You have built up on that. And um, again, we will have questions. We'll take that later. And now, uh, let me go to Avilash. Avilash, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, Avilash, you are on mute. Yeah. Yep, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, Avilash, um, let us listen to your side of story. As as you have 
varied experience in the media and uh, you know probably you can enrich our attendee from your point and over to you thank you very much thank you nandan for the intro thank you abp and the panelists for joining me on the session uh, so i'd like to just say one thing right so over time what we've seen is that today all of us have a digital presence if you went back 10 years ago 15 years ago not all of us were digitally there now all of us are there and there are different aspects of digital for different people now a lot of folks have asked what can you do in terms of digital marketing so let me take a few stories right so i mean what you can see and how digital and internet has empowered people is that you can be good at anything so let's say you're good at cooking today internet gives you a platform where your recipe for the biryani can now be seen by millions of people right and if you can really make a good biryani you can make a lot of money of it as well because when people come to your site and see the recipe you get money of the ads right you could be if you are great at gadgets and you know that this is how mobiles work right when you put a mobile unboxing video or you talk about a mobile then people come and watch your channel right and for a lot of you folks who are asking what you can do in order to get into digital what i would urge is pick anything that you are passionate about and regardless of what you want i mean if you like text you can go to a blog if you want to make a video you can make a video and create a youtube channel and anything that you do trying to build a followership and engagement is probably the best exercise in digital that you are going to get and let's say you put in a channel and get your friends and family to follow and interact and then see who are the other people who come on that actually is the starting block of what you will end up doing in a corporate in any kind of job so i mean i thought of like to leave it at that in my view the best way to learn is by doing and the great joy of digital is that it is so easy to do anything right if you want to make a video there are apps out there data is cheap phones are no smartphones are there with a lot of people you can make a video and you can upload and then the interaction just goes through i mean we have not had a platform for self expression which has been this democratic through all of humanity so yeah or uh, over to you nandan thank you thank you thank you avilash so this is brilliant actually uh, what you have just mentioned is i think extremely important to our young generation which is thinking about transforming their skill into monetizing by leveraging the div digital advantage that we are having these days which is extremely important because you know in in the uh, forthcoming world everything is changing not only because of digital but also because of the prevailing predicaments that we have been going through right now and therefore there will be opportunities and threats and if someone has a particular ability that could be promoted onto the digital platform and made good amount of earning you know it's 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 a good day's work after all then we should really think about it and and that's really good amount of money you wouldn't imagine how an influence marketer through instagram can uh, earn about nothing <laughs> less than 50000 60000 rupees a month you know if if they're serious about it it's not just you open an instagram account and you start getting that money no you have to be serious you have to understand what you are doing and you have to really work with this you have to really work on this so that is one and uh, abhilash has emphasized on another very basic thing which is important to digital marketing that is hands on training so there are a few questions which will relate to this particular thing i will come to those questions but before that i would just like to mention one thing and after that we'll go on to the question answer session and there will be more of a discussion probably now the thing that i'm going to mention is that 
in a seminar somewhere, I was once asked a question. Uh, someone asked me, tell me a good book for next 10 years. So I had to say that there is no such book because by the time a book is written, proofread and get published, the digital marketing technologies change and you know it upgrades itself. So, well, there are books, you can keep those books for reference, but the most important thing is you will have to learn as you go. You'll have to learn through micro learning. You'll have to get into things and learn by trial and error even. So there are many ways, many sessions, many, many educational sessions and, and you know, learning sessions on the web. There are lessons, there are trainings. So one has to go through all these, one has to do a regular upgradation of himself or herself to be able to keep up with the digital technologies. So with this, uh, shall we go to the question answer session, gentlemen? Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, great, great. So um, there is an excellent question at the very beginning now I can see. There are some questions which are answered and I would rather put this question to uh, Vikash, if I may. What skills do employers look for while hiring a digital marketing fresher? I don't know what a digital marketing fresher is, honestly, <laughs> but uh, yeah, would you like to answer that, Vikash? Yeah, actually, I think, you know, a uh, great question. I think, like you said, I don't know what a digital marketing fresher is. But I think when we look at graduates or fresh graduates who've just sort of passed out of their undergrad degree or even their B school degree, I think often what we see is that they may not have uh, the knowledge when it comes to marketing or digital marketing itself, right? They don't have hands on knowledge uh, to, let's say, you know, how do you create a campaign on, on, let's say, Instagram or how do you, you know, advertise on Google to get that going or how do you create content on your blog so that you get discovered and get traffic from, from search engines? So there are so many different areas in digital and, and actually when we look at it, we don't expect candidates to actually have that knowledge or the experience. So we actually train them. We have, uh, you know, our own our team that sort of trains you on how to do things. But what we do look for are a couple of uh, soft elements. One is definitely in terms of uh, either you need to be creative or you need to be strategic in the way or analytical in the way you look at things, right? So either you need to have uh, the left brain or the right brain. One of these two needs to be strong. So we look at, are you super creative? Can you come up with new ideas? Can you come up with interesting campaigns uh, on one front? Or alternatively, you could also be very analytical, very data-driven numbers person who can really look at something and analyze and take out some insights from it. So really look at that kind of an approach when, when we uh, you know, evaluate pressures. The other piece we definitely also look at is, are you... You know, do you have the core skills in terms of communication, in terms of being able to, you know, really work as a team? And have you demonstrated working as a team, even if it's a student club or clubs back in your college, and really having worked together on, on certain projects together? So I think that entire team aspect, uh, communication aspect is something that we strongly look at. And the last and most important is definitely the positive attitude and the attitude to be able to unlearn and relearn things quite quickly, right? And are you adaptable to all of that? So actually a lot of the soft skills is what we really look at from pressures. I think the technical knowledge of digital and marketing is something that you pick up over time as you learn. I hope that answers to some extent. Great. Yeah, no, that's great. So um, anyone uh, wish to add anything to it? Abhishek, Avilash, Atanu, anyone? No? Right. So that's that's brilliant that should answer the question uh i just would like to add one thing if i if i look at the question from the student's perspective which i guess is something like this i have studied this a subject x but i cannot find how how it is relevant to digital marketing if the question is that that and i can see there are a few other questions which are a similar like how can i prepare myself in digital marketing job how can i get a digital marketing job if i am from some other uh, discipline like not marketing or not engineering so probably we can compile those things and and tell you something if you have a capability as 
all of our panelists have said anything at all if if you want to do something or enjoy doing something like you want to write something you want to draw something you like writing or drawing so you can work in content areas content marketing is a big thing you if you are good in analysis obviously you can work in analytics if you are good in social sciences like human psychology social behavior organizational behaviors come we have places for you absolutely my point is that if you cannot find what it is that you can do in a digital marketing but still you want to get into digital marketing the first thing you should do do an international search for jobs in amazon in uh, flipkart of course but flipkart is not international in amazon in ebay in paypal companies like this you will see weird kind of jobs there right so uh, i will probably uh, show you some of those jobs later but not now so in those kind of jobs you will see the job descriptions and let me tell you you will be surprised to see that one of your skills is probably there that they are looking for so that is one way of understanding how you can utilize your skill into getting a job in the digital marketing but but that may not be the way to get the job because that job may be at you know in san francisco or alaska wherever so you can try to find out similar jobs or you can go to a company or a headhunter and tell them this is it what i can do and i want some job similar to this those ways are very useful i can tell you so so with that let us go to the um, next question it's a very simple question and i know for sure that atanu does that so i'm just going to put that question to atanu uh, difference between digital marketing and social media in marketing so it, uh, the question is not well formed i i give it okay. that but because uh, yeah because no, but, uh, probably yeah. you'll be able to yeah explain. yeah, yeah. No, no, that's, that's okay uh, yes i saw that question so uh, uh, digital marketing has various components, uh, various levers uh, uh, through which you basically communicate. So here again, uh, when you're talking about digital marketing or social media marketing, we're basically talking about digital advertising and social media advertising or communication. Uh, and there are various channels of doing that. Social media is one of the many uh, communication channels. So you can do it through, let's say, a video, you can do it through, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, search. Or, or you can see an ad in a in in ABP, okay, or Telegraph. So those are also digital marketing communication. Social media is one such medium of communication among many. And now that obviously comes to the definition of social media. What exactly is social media? Now there are a lot of you know uh, technical definition of social media. I, I will not get into that. But essentially, those media where you can uh, collaborate with multiple people so they, they, that will be called a social media so typically if you are seeing an ad in a uh, in a telegraph online probably that will not be classified as a social media advertisement that will be classified more as a what is called a display advertising uh, even though there's not much of difference conceptually but just because the telegraph online is a media of communicating uh kind of news or information whereas same thing when you talk about facebook or instagram you are expected to uh you know interact okay. so today facebook uh, has also become a uh, uh distribution channel of news so those kind of media like facebook linkedin uh twitter etc where your people are expected to interact with each other which are commonly called social media where you are communicating in those platforms though that is the social media So yeah, does that? I, I I hope that answered the question. Yeah, right. So there's just another nuance that I would like to add on to it. Please. So please. I mean, typically when you look at marketing, there is one form which is called paid promotion, where you can have an ad and that is sort of put in on where it is. So I mean, if it's a search ad, it's called an SEO ad. If it's a YouTube ad, it's a YouTube ad. If it's a Facebook ad, etc., it's a Facebook ad. The other aspect of this is the whole influencer-led story and 
a large part of the draw for that is that a lot of communication happens for a brand leveraging the social media not necessarily paid social media so i mean if that is the nuance that you're looking for that is the other angle on it because a lot of people don't like to advertise they would like for their messaging to get across virally so i mean if i wanted to talk about a movie review i would rather go it through some level of reviewing and so on so forth rather than putting a trailer ad in front of you i mean essentially the messaging is the same watch the movie it's just how the message comes in front of you which is different right yeah great so um i think we can now go to the next question which is um it says what is attracting marketing how i do this i think this question question is referring to attraction marketing so it is it is to be very <laughs> honest it is just a new term for differentiating your product against your competitors product and attracting your customers nothing else and how you do this is really based on your um, activities your strategies and action plan so um i was going to put that question to avilash so avilash um would you like to add on uh, how how do you differentiate and attract customers basically that's the question Yeah, I mean, look. So I'm not sure exactly what the term means, but uh, I mean, look at the core of it. When you are spending or when you have uh, doing digital marketing, you typically have objectives. Now, those objectives typically align to what is the nature of business you are in and what it is you are looking at. So I mean, when digital initially started, it started as an add-on to conventional marketing. and all conventional marketing was brand marketing so any uh, advertisement that would typically be there would basically put the value prop of the brand as it were right so it's the same message on a digital medium uh, going forward as digital enabled its own ecosystems a lot of objectives started getting met from digital itself so if for example i want to sell through an e-commerce website the entire exercise can happen online or through an app now there are typically if the outcome that i'm looking at is i want to get people to come to a website or download an app then my advertising objectives would be aligned to that and i would typically be spending on those right and this is basically around the same right okay great Yeah. Uh, one another uh, yeah. point I just want to add. Uh, yes. Yeah. I think Nandi was right. Probably uh, whoever put the question he meant attraction marketing. Is basically when you, it it one form of inbound marketing. So if if a pro, if if somebody is already you know needing a particular product, let's say I want a digital marketing course. So I, you don't have to really sell digital marketing course to me, but I am not sure which uh, institute to go and learn. so whatever is the xyz institute that wants to ensure that is the top of the mind we call okay when somebody is actually you are not trying to sell the product per se you are trying to sell the brand when the product is already sold kind of the person so there are various techniques of doing that for example search marketing which can be both paid search marketing or organic search marketing so there obviously if your brand is on the top and uh, then that definitely into the ctr and uh, you know that helps with your product marketing even let's say things like remarketing remarketing is i think there's one question on remarketing so very quickly if you have if a user have already uh, expect interest in your uh, product or brand then you try to uh, you know reach out to those specific people so remarketing is another very uh, interesting way of you know uh, going to uh, um, doing a product marketing and there are various other targeting options as not get into too much of technical details but there are various targeting options by which you can actually uh, reach those customers who already want that particular product and you want your brand to be visible to them right hello yeah yeah okay great so yeah yeah no that's fine so um i think we were going to go to the next question which is um 
a very specific question this time. Uh, I'm a student of management. So my question is, how is customer relationship management and customer lifecycle management related to digital marketing? And can you kindly explain CRM and CLM and explain the career opportunities? It's, it's a big, uh, you know, broad question. But um, if I may put it to Avishek, um, you can probably give an idea to, um, you know, to this gentleman as to what those things are and how that can help in digital marketing, right? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, relevant uh, question. You see, there's a very common saying saying that it's, it's far better to retain your customer than keep on attracting new customers, right? It always, there are various uh, maths around it, how much, how many times more expensive it is to acquire a new customer than retain your existing customer. So whichever product or service you are in, customer relationship uh, management is very important. Something as simple as, let's say somebody goes to a Lakme salon for a haircut. And Lakme takes uh, that lady's uh, date of birth and mobile phone. And before her uh, birthday or before any other important event in her life, like her anniversary, they keep sending her messages and they can offer her customized products and uh, services, right? That is a form of Lakme trying to say, you have already come to my store, you have liked the service I provided to you, and I will keep trying to retain you. I will keep trying to ensure that you come back to me because that will always cost me less than having to make another lady walk into the Lakme store. So that is just broadly giving you with an example. What today we are seeing across product and services is because of data that digital marketing throws up. The entire customer lifecycle management or what we call funnel management, which is right from top of the funnel to your loyalist, is all about managing the conversion of people who are stuck at different stages of the funnel. So right from who is your target audience to who is aware of you, to who has tried you, to who has repeated tried you, who is repeatedly trying you, who is now such a big loyalist that who will recommend you. And that is where the concept of NPS or net promoter score also comes in, right? So customer lifecycle management and customer relationship management are the same. Uh, Digital is empowering these uh, verticals within organizations. Uh, clearly, uh, the degree to which companies are investing in this varies. In a service brand like an Amazon, they are, they are very particular about it. And Amazon is known to be the gold standard on customer uh, uh, management because their NPS score of 60 plus or 70 plus monitor is the gold standard. So how well Amazon is able to retain its customers and gives them multiple reasons to stick on to Amazon, not just to buy on Amazon, but to view on Amazon Prime and become a member of Amazon Prime and provide subscription free to them and so on. These are all techniques that companies use for their customer lifecycle management or loyalty management. Uh, essentially, to build a career in uh, any of these uh, functions, you would typically join these organizations uh, after having some experience on the shop floor or doing some operational roles. Uh, otherwise, you will be doing very support kind of uh, customer relation management, such as contact center, which is also now getting automated a lot. The entire 20 years ago, how call center, contact center used to be is going to change completely. Now we are all aware of uh, bots and how AI is completely replacing human-based uh, uh, customer management so that there's far more standardization and quality. So it's very important that you first understand your business. What is the product and service you offer? Who is your customer? Understanding the life cycle and the funnel that the way I explained. Then you get more experience as a CRM or CLM uh, person. That's the way it happens. But uh, it's definitely relevant whether it's a product company or a service company. It's, I think a bit more relevant in service companies today, but even product companies are realizing that if they really want to build brands, they need to own their customer and hence they have to do digital marketing and other uh, techniques to own customer data and understand who their customer is to be building loyalty. Ultimately, everybody wants loyalty, right? And loyalty is a very hard thing to get in today's time because cost of switching has almost come down to zero, right? Uh, so yeah, that is what I would like to comment.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, if I may, I'd just like to um, add a few points, which is, uh, it's, it's a very interesting question in terms of that customer life cycle. That term has been being practiced and discussed since ages. But the way we are these days measuring up or rather mapping customer life cycle is quite different. Because earlier, we had no way to get into a customer's head. We had ways to get into the customer's household, to some extent into his mind. But these days we know exactly without asking the customer what he or she is doing through the mobile phone, through the browsing history, through the locations, through the emojis, and believe me, all those things are captured. Now, these days, actually, the larger organizations try to keep tab on each and every customer. Now, it, it may sound quite, you know, uh, <laughs> quite odd, but this is actually being happening. And sometimes, because of the data privacy thing, the customers cannot be identified at least in Western countries. And what they do is the, they create a persona for that particular customer, which in other words, an avatar or diva, right? So that persona is being created and maintained in the company's database as a customer and everything is being monitored, everything. Not only the purchase of this company's product, but also the purchases of other companies' products, also the likes of the customer, the dislikes of the customers, the customers' relations, the friends, everything, everything. There is nothing at all that this persona is not interested in collecting. So that is how a customer life cycle is being mapped these days. And that life cycle never ends because, you know, purchase things as you are a management student, you must have known this AIDA funnel and all that. Now, once a customer go through the AIDA funnel, finishes it off, then he or she actually starts another funnel, another, another journey. So these journeys, journeys are endless. Now, you guys might ask me, how is it possible to individually monitor those many people, those many persons, and collect the data and even analyze that? And that is why this term big data has come up. You know, it's, it's really big data. And just because we cannot do that uh, by humans, we are utilizing artificial intelligences, machine learning, deep learning, blockchain, and so on and so forth. We are not going into that details but it is possible and there are companies servicing companies who do that for marketing organizations or or companies who sell their product and these servicing companies start from ibm and goes to anything like ibm adobe uh, um, gartner and there are big big companies those who are only collecting data analyzing it giving the insight and suggesting the marketing plans Adobe is even giving them the marketing activity automated as well. So that is how the customer life cycle is being managed. And in the whole cycle of this operation, they need a lot of personnel who have different skill sets or, you know, set of skill sets. So with this, let us go to the um, next question, which I think I, I, I'm not sure who to put it in just because Avilash is, uh, you know, has, a very intense experience in media. I'm going to do that. Uh, there is one who is a content marketer in the IT sector for the last seven, eight years. And um, she wants to enhance her skill set into SEO, uh, into, into being able to do SEO and stuff. Avilash, would you like to take that question? And, and everybody else is welcome, really, to add in later. So, Avilash, can I? Yep. I think the question was in terms of wanting to enhance the skill set. And yeah. uh, I mean, the answer there for you will lie in which direction you want to sort of go into. I mean, so writing copy is one aspect of the story. The other is whether now 
you want to go on the technical track or you want to go on the managing spend track will determine what are the skill sets that you need to augment so I many it is let's say getting technical with respect to doing seo and so on so forth that would need for you to go more towards the tech side of things if you want to go towards the campaign management and other side of things uh, what you'll need to start getting to is that once you put in a campaign you'll have to see what is the objective and what is the efficiency of achievement for that outcome and that sort of the path to go there i mean i hope i answered that yeah 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 okay no that's great and the same same person has asked how to get into seo as well from content so uh i i wonder who would like to answer that yeah i, I can attempt it so yeah please i think please, uh, carry on yeah thanks avilash for that i think you know daiti said that content itself has multiple routes you can take you can either go down to copy or content itself go deeper there uh, and i think when it comes to seo or otherwise known as search engine optimization i think it's actually evolved over time and i think uh, someone who specializes in seo needs to have uh, you know an understanding of how content and content marketing works an understanding of how google and the search engine works and also at the same time how does the entire website and the architecture work right because a lot of it has actually become very technical now in terms of being able to actually have the right kind of uh, tags a lot of elements on the website itself that makes sense so you need to really also have some hands on experience to understand what technical elements can you refine for google to rank you for it but i think content still remains a key to that entire space right if you can write amazing content uh, and long form content video content infographics any kind of content that users would love to consume and share i think that content still holds good and and if you're good at content writing i think that's probably the best place to be in that entire seo and content marketing space so maybe even refine those content skills itself in writing content in a much more engaging way that that's probably holds good as well yeah great so um will anyone else uh add anything to this if not then i'll just go to the next question i i think that sufficiently answers the question but if anyone else wants to add anything please do right okay so um the next question i will put it to ovishek first and then to atanu and then we'll open for the panel it is it is basically two questions combined now how does one generate to create their brand if one is in educational sector for example educational institute or if one is in a legal sector a legal practitioner for example so i am putting these two together although they are from different genre but they are service so so i'm i'm just um asking abhishek to start this and then we can join then atanu and we can join in right it's a it's a very relevant question i think today everybody has to be a brand right uh, that might sound very generalist but let me come to the first uh, part which is the education sector right in education sector today because of edutech what is happening let's say you are a teacher as an individual you yourself need to create a brand for yourself by saying what is it that your audience is really looking at let's say if you're someone who has been coaching kids to appear for entrance exams and you have a certain good track record that is what speaks for your brand that is why people should avail of your service right so now coming to the legal service provider if you are a lawyer or if you are a legal firm what is it that people are expecting out of a law firm or a legal firm the professional uh, service that you offer how good are you at confidentiality what is your case rate and so on right so any brand that you want to build it needs to start by who is your target audience understanding the core insight of your target audience which is what do they think what do they feel and what do they do about availing your product and service and then what is often terms now being called as the moat right uh, m o a t moat which is a bit beyond just brand now what has happened in the last few decades because of the industrial era and the Uh, whole consumerist era as we had proliferation of brands 
but often times between brands there was very less differentiation it almost felt like you could replace the label of one brand with another and you were consuming the same product or you went to one service provider or another and you felt like you were consuming the same service what digital marketing is enabling is to really go much deeper into differentiation and building a moat because if you don't do that you will just be any other brand right so coming back to the example of the education sector uh, brand what is your moat is it the kind of expertise you have in the subjects you offer the degrees you offer the success of your students how well have you been able to project that that could be one way of creating differentiation for you coming to the legal service provider what kind of legal service are you specializing in right there could be very various kinds of legal services you provide criminal law family law uh, corporate law so on within that also how deep have you gone what is the retinue of your clientele like how on, how will they give you a testimonial how will they recommend you on various professional platforms like linkedin and so on right will they give you a recommendation on your website so differentiation through digital marketing is very important understanding of differentiation is all about those three things that i mentioned who is your target audience what is the insight and how well are you able to deliver on that i would request the other panelists to add on that but that's my opening comment yeah right atanu would you like to add something on it and uh, while yeah. while you do that atanu just a request while you do that you can extend possibly that into uh, uh, answering that question which is about personal brand how to build a personal brand yeah. I was about to come to that. First of all, there is a big similarity between education and uh, legal. Uh, probably that's the reason why you rightly club the two questions because both these are credence services. And what is typically uh, termed in service uh, marketing terminology as credence services? That means you, you experience the service and then only you you can uh, give a judgment uh, whether the service is good or bad. So it's it's it, it depends on a lot on trust. So education, uh, legal, medical. You go to a doctor for trust. Okay, you hardly see a doctor come and say, okay, come come treat with me or a lawyer come and uh, in the case and come. I, I'm here to help out. Okay, you will you will not see a lot of these professionals actively uh, promoting themselves. In fact, even if somebody does it, it is not considered to be. very credible you will probably not respect a doctor who is actively marketing himself uh, so it, it, there's a credence part of it so in such a service where which is credence service where uh, 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 um, you know uh, uh, um, uh, right in the face kind of marketing is not really appreciated the first thing is your presence that means you need to be discoverable so in fact one of the questions was that uh, some many so people have asked that where where do we go and learn digital marketing so obviously the i mean going back from this uh, from, uh, from the session the first thing that what they will do they will go and search in google digital marketing course in whatever in the city and if i am providing a digital i am an institute providing a digital marketing course the first thing is, uh, is i have to be present there okay because if i'm not present there then i i can't i can't expect to get a mind share the second thing is that once you have done that then you have to build a personal reputation reputation of your brand and how do you do that you do that by demonstrating your work and today that work demonstration has to be also online for example many of the professional services companies including legal uh, 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 other professions they uh, update case studies in their portals and there are various ways of uh, putting case studies there they put uh, customer credential video so these days video credentials have become very um, uh, very, very popular because of the authenticity so if i am a doctor if i am a lawyer if there are video credential of course in some cases there privacy issues involved but uh, wherever it is possible if uh, it is possible to give video credentials okay, so that gives the credibility okay and finally there will be some cases probably you need to what is called generate leads some education needs to do that some legal firm some uh, you know hospitals probably will do that generate it actively seeking leads uh, that uh, uh, but that will come much later that will come once you have built a brand okay. so so there are techniques in 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 digital marketing where you can actively generate leads and coming to personal branding absolutely right nandanda that uh, that's where you know platforms like linkedin 
and all are very very active and there are uh, uh, i mean there, 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 there are ways by which you can optimize your linkedin profile uh, where you can show your credentials and i think people like lawyers and all that that's something that they must do they put uh, put the uh, put their profile in linkedin uh, uh, very strong so that people searching for such professionals will uh, get them so that that would be my addition to whatever yeah. Right. Okay. Great. So, um, shall we go to the next question? Right. So, the next question is um, a very basic one. What is the best way to learn digital marketing, online class or offline class? I would say it doesn't matter as long as you get to understand the hands on approach of the thing. Unless you do it, just by reading, learning digital marketing is a bit difficult, honestly. Anyway, any panelists would like to add on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll no, no, I'll that. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, please Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. See, I, I would definitely agree with you, Nandanda. Uh, only one addition that probably three months or maybe six months back, I would have still said that uh, classroom classes definitely is preferred because of the practical nature of the subject but over the last six months the way uh, digital education has transformed themselves i i would say there's not much of difference in fact in certain places probably online education have an advantage uh, over yeah. physical classrooms okay so i i would say this uh, it doesn't matter right um vikash you are saying something yeah i was saying i think the way i look at it and, and we we do have our own training arm digi grad where we do all of this what you realized over time is that people who love classroom classes are the ones that uh, you know uh, preferred to be sort of spoon fed in that sense. Right? They want to be given everything. They want yeah. to be told everything. Yeah. They sort of want to be there and forced to do some things, right? Whereas the ownership of learning when it's an online class, a lot of it depends on you. A lot of it is, uh, are you taking the onus to read the pre-reading material? Are you sort of preparing yeah. for it? Are you doing, uh, you know, are you attending, paying attention or, you know, sort of switching off a camera and doing whatever you want? So I think the ownership levels when it comes to an online class and especially if it's a, you know, self-paced course where the content is already online and it's not a live class. I think over there, it, the ownership is even higher, right? You really need to push yourself to complete the program and, and the completion rates become a challenge in some of those. So I think it comes down to whether do you have that passion to learn digital then it doesn't matter where you are, but if you need some nudge and you need some pushing, that's really where the offline classes come into play a lot. But of course, uh, till COVID is, is here, I think offline classes are going to be a huge challenge, but post yes. that, uh, maybe that would pick up again. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So um, there are- I would four... just like to add, if I may- Please, uh, please, please, Abhishek, please do. I think uh, there will be a deluge of people seeking certification, right? Uh, I would, my only caution to them is don't go after shopping for certificates. You cannot buy experience. You have to do things. I think both Vikas, Abhilash and uh, even Atanu, all of you have said this before. Digital marketing is such a practical topic. The course that you learned last year might become redundant, whether it was online or offline, right? The first thing you have to do is get into a live situation whether it is creating your own uh, platform, your own channel across platforms, or working for a startup, working for a company, take up a project, uh, do something in your free time. The, my biggest advice to students today versus when we were students is don't just rely on your degree. Do not just rely on your certification. Honestly speaking, after a point, I'm, me as a recruiter, I don't look at degrees of people. I don't See whether someone is from an IM or an IIT. I only just see whether that person has the hunger to execute and hunger to learn. And especially for fresher, what does the degree matter really, right? Yeah, maybe the college you went to kind of signifies that, okay, you studied well in your school, that's why you made it to a certain college, so on. But beyond a point, a lot of us know that how our exam system works, right? People have gamed this, right? You, your marks do not mean anything. So, Likewise, just passing an online certificate means nothing, right? You can pay for the certificate. You can just do those multiple uh, option questions and get the degree. Uh, beyond a point, I will not really hire someone just because he has a he or she has an online degree or an offline course. I would look at 
what if that person is really interested in digital marketing what was he or she doing in his learning years apart from going to a college or doing a, a distance learning program was he or she actively working for a startup today there are so many opportunities you can just go on linkedin through your network find a startup job there are multiple platforms uh, where even i have recruited from whether it's uh, internship or so on where people are constantly giving internships two month three month have you really done an internship prove what you achieved in that and the biggest success of what you've learned is proof of what you've done yeah. if you did yeah. a three month project show me the evidence of it what was the data before you did that project and what happened after i will really value whether you've done something live rather than 10 degrees that you've got on udemy or uh you know an academy or uh, by jews or there are so many courses that you can literally buy you cannot buy education you cannot buy it uh, i know I, this is a education platform which i'm saying this but there's no substitute for experience my biggest advice to everyone is please don't just go shopping for education buying degrees whether it's online or offline get your hands dirty do a project go and actively seek an opportunity to work in your father's company in your neighbor's company in a friend's company anywhere it doesn't matter i won't i don't care whether you work for a big brand or small i will judge you by were you keen to learn and go and did a project somewhere even if it is a free project did you show initiative there the moment you showed initiative and did a free project somewhere that person will like you and will want to retain you and give you a paid project and then eventually will hire you right so that is where i would really urge everyone to focus on of course get the degrees get some technical knowledge but don't waste your time shopping degrees please you have to have to do something on the job and life i mean i'm not degrading any platform you can go and definitely pay your uh, hard earned savings and buy degrees learn from those people but it will still not come to much unless you have done something real and practical absolutely absolutely good fantastic thank you uh, uh avilash do you want to add anything on this no i mean abhishek sort of covered it in full i mean instead of certification what i would urge a lot of these folks is you can try and do an internship with any company that is doing something that you are interested in and a meaningful way to get that would be to put a proposition that makes sense So, I mean, Absolutely. if you like something, you pitch an internship, and I mean, there are ways for things to happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you. Um, I think we have about ten minutes to wrap up. There are a few questions. I'm just trying to club a few. Uh, like, uh, there is a question: uh, best free tools for SEO, uh, uh, how to market our own websites and channels, to do SEO. and uh yeah i think i'll club these two so who would like to answer those questions on seo anyone i i can throw it to the panel really so vikas you are yeah i can i can give it a shot i, I also yeah, sent please. a link on i sent a link in the chat because i mean that that topic itself you could talk for like 30 40 yeah minutes. yeah okay. but i think uh, top three tools for seo i think I think the best place to start would be the free tools that Google has. So, Google has Google Analytics as well as the Google Search Console. I think those are great places to begin understanding what's happening to your site. What is are you ranking for anything at all, uh, and, and stuff like that. If you want to look at competitor data, I think unfortunately many of those tools are paid tools, but they'll give you a glimpse of it at least at the at the trial period or during the initial days. So there, you would definitely recommend. uh two tools one is moz moz and the other one is uh, ahrefs uh and i think there are more expensive and more advanced tools but these two would give you some competitor data which will help you and of course uh, one one other one is uh, a google keyword planner which will give you some sense of the keyword keywords that users are using and so the keyword planner as well as google trends uh, so google actually has a whole bunch of stuff so those tools would be a great place to start brilliant brilliant and um there is another question flipkart or amazon how can i start this type of business i don't think you are really intending to start at that level or that scale no 
But if it is, uh, you know, that kind of a portal that you are talking about, probably I'll put that question to Atanu because I know he has experience in working this. So Atanu, would you like to answer that briefly? Yeah, I mean, before Thank I you. answer that, I mean, if I knew how to start Amazon on Flipkart, I would have done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, but uh, jokes apart, I mean, I think the important, probably, probably whoever asked that question is asking of how to, there are two aspects to it. One is uh, Amazon's and Flipkart, they're platforms. Okay, so that means they are uh, uh, essentially intermediaries between buyers and sellers. So if you're trying to build such a platform, one, one, one thing is very important. Of, and if you're trying to build that in scale, obviously it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big game because it requires a lot of investment and all. So you can start off with maybe a niche product, okay? maybe a product that probably like, like there, are, there are people who are starting off with, let's say organic food, or let's say uh, you know handicraft of a special region because if you're trying to cover the entire range here you're a direct competition with amazon and flipkart uh, and the likes and it is it is difficult uh, it's a difficult business there okay it's a big boy, big boys game but if it is a niche product that you have uh, and and you are kind kind of maybe some uh, some specific product from certain region there are some Handicrafts that are very popular in certain regions and probably there's a demand all over the all over the globe. You can start on 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 those kind of uh, products. The important thing would be here more than technology, the supply chain is very important because technology here can be built like any other technology. It just requires an e-commerce platform, uh, but you need to have the an efficient supply chain both uh, your inbound as well as outbound. So those are some of the things that you need to look at. The other is that if you are, let's say, a, if you are a manufacturer of, let's say, leather bags or something like that, and you want to uh, create a new distribution channel through a portal, then you can have your own portal and try and do that, as well as you can also sell that on Amazon or a Flipkart. So, uh, because sometimes what happens is that if you are uh, opening your own portal, advertising that marketing that is expensive, so you can sell on Amazon and probably give Amazon a commission for that. Okay, so these are some of the things that you can probably do. Fantastic, <clears throat> thank you. So um, we'll have about uh, a time for two more questions. So the the next question I think we should pick on is um, how can digital marketing be effective in manufacturing industries? I can say just a few words about that because I have worked in manufacturing industries. Now. You know, when we talk about digital marketing and reaching out to customers, manufacturing industries do talk about that, but in a little different manner. What they really need to do is to prove their excellence of the product and provide the customer experience. Now, basically in manufacturing industries, that is we call it B2B, business to business um, marketing, over there, they always try to uh, provide the customer with something what they call is um, feature advantage and benefit analysis, FAB analysis, and the customer experience. Now, these days, the digital channels that they have can be utilized to provide that experience even with utilizing VR and AR if that's available at the customer's end. Now, uh, for that, you will see there are a lot of YouTube channels for many manufacturing interests, industries where they would like to provide the features of their products, um, you know, as a video marketing, as a, as a video thing, cars, planes, pumps, everyone. So it's not about reaching out to individual end users but about providing the kind of experience to their customers, which are not the individual end users at the outside. So that is what my answer is. If anyone wishes to add anything to that, please do. No? Right, okay. So um, I think uh, the last question, it is really a very interesting question. How Facebook algorithm works? I doubt even if Mark knows, really. So um, <laughs> I, I think I, I should open the question to the panel. Everyone, feel free to pitch in. You yeah, can no, no, write uh, a blog post. Sorry, go ahead. 
sorry. No, it, it, it's an apparent naive uh, question about uh, some deep uh, meaning to it. So yes, of course, I mean, nobody, nobody, uh, nobody really knows how uh, Facebook, Google algorithm works because that's the secret sauce. And for most of the algorithms, they are pretty secretive about it. So the answer uh, to that is nobody really knows. But having said that, uh, I think the bigger question is that, should we know? Uh, and then that's where, you know, that, that's where the entire uh, question of, you know, the black box uh, that, for example, uh, we don't know how exactly uh, uh, Google works in terms of ranking the websites. You know, now the question can be that, is it fair? Is it, should, should everybody know that how Google is actually ranking the websites? So that's the bigger question. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's actually a very deep question in terms of, uh, no, it is. the fact it that is we don't actually. know, we don't know how Facebook works, or we don't know how algorithm works, whether it has a long-term, uh, what kind of long-term implications it has on data privacy or on, 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 the, on the whole uh, aspect of it. So that would be my, uh, I don't think I've answered the question, but my observation. Yeah, please, um, because you were saying something and then probably uh, everyone else can join uh, in. No, I think Abhishek, you, you, you were saying something, Abhishek, you want to go for it? First. No, go ahead, Vikas. First, I was just trying to make a comment that uh, whoever knows the answer, please write a blog post. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I, th I think uh, just two quick points there. I think one is I, I don't think it's, it's not static, right? I think the algorithm evolves and breathes and keeps getting refined. So. Even if I knew what it, it did today, I think it would obviously change after six months or nine months or 12 yeah. months. So I think that's one part of that puzzle and which is why I think that the answer is actually, a, it's a very tough question to answer because it keeps evolving. I think the second part of that question is, how does Facebook work or how does Google work from whose perspective, right? Because there are multiple stakeholders here. Obviously one is Google itself or Facebook itself, so the platform itself. The other is obviously, you know, consumers like us, then you have advertisers uh, and, and brands that actually find a way so that the you know, platform can monetize. So there are multiple people and I think for each of them, it works slightly differently. And I think, uh, I think like, uh, like Abhila said, I think it's a very deep, I mean, sorry, as Mr. Atanu said, it's a very deep question, uh, but hopefully uh, in our lifetime, we'll find out how these algorithms work. Avilash, want to add anything? I mean, look, uh, just one part, I mean, what Vikas said, and there are more aspects to that. One is, how does the algorithm work to show you content in your feed? I mean, Facebook has algorithms which show whose updates you are getting. If you have, let's say, 500 friends, 1,000 friends, whose update is coming? And some of those aspects might be linked to stuff like whose updates do you click on, whose updates do you like on? And for a lot of these algorithms, they operate on a mix of signals. So as a user, you interact with the platform and provide them signals like like, share, comment, and so on and so forth. You do the same thing with advertisements on the platform. Now, depending upon what Facebook wants to do at that given point in time, whether it is to generate revenue for an advertiser, in which case they would show you an ad instead of a friend's post, and that is something that is dynamic as Vikas sort of called out. So what that algorithm is doing is not fixed. And Absolutely. who it is working for is also not fixed. So the answer in that way is very dynamic. It eventually determined, is determined by what Mark needs to do at that point in time. Absolutely, yes, yes. So um, if I may add something to this, um, and my friends don't feel bad that I started with a laugh because I enjoyed the question, that's why I laughed. It is a very deep question indeed. But my reply would be, do you really need to understand the Facebook algorithm? I don't think you do. As every panelist say, it's, it's very well-guarded secret. It's dynamic, it's very dynamic. Now, if I may draw some sort of analogy into it, not a good one, but nevertheless, I'm going to do it. Uh, when someone falls in love, I did once, long, long, long time back. I know it's, it's very difficult to believe now, having looked at me, but I did. Well, so um, then what I do keeps on changing every day, depending on as 
Abhilash is saying what kind of signals and inputs I'm getting. These day I am wearing this shirt and the other day I am wearing another shirt, wearing another perfume. So basically you are changing your outputs and processing depending on what's happening in your global environment. I don't know if I have made it clear, but what I'm trying to tell you is that the dynamism, Facebook algorithm or Google algorithm, the dynamism is no less complicated than a real life algorithm that works in our mind and environment, right? So it is better not to try to understand that, rather, it is better to have an understanding about what it's doing. What is the result? Now, if you really go onto Facebook and you know, run a Facebook campaign, you will get different results at different times of the day, different times of the weeks and so on and so forth. So if you really keep on doing that with a certain objective, you will refine your Facebook advertisement. You know, in a Facebook advertisement, if someone asks you, how much should I spend and when can I get results? No one can answer because of that very uh, thing. Because it's dynamic, because it's keep changing, because no, no one knows the, the mathematics behind it. And so you have to learn the outcomes, not the origination. So that should be the philosophy in understanding this, as I believe. And... Uh, that is that is my answer to this and before ending uh vikash there is a specific question for you it's it's named you as, as the person which the question to is consistency is key for digital marketing how long does a content marketing campaign ideally take to be a hit or a miss uh i think uh great question i think it, it i don't think content marketing is a one time effort or an effort which is a finite amount of time right so i think it is it's like marketing it's like branding it's something you do over a period of time but i think in terms of the minimum time it would take for you to see the success or to see real impact it would be anywhere between two to four months in my view so i think within 60 days uh, you should start seeing some uptick in the efforts that you put in your website should start getting some some more traffic uh, and if you don't see it within four months then definitely something's some things need to be changed for you to get the effort, uh, to get the impact right. I hope that helps. Yeah, brilliant. And the same person, that's the last question, I think from the same person, how can we avoid from making noise versus providing authentic, relevant content to our users? Well, you know, Vikash, would you like to answer that as well? It's from the same person. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think there I would say, you need to find the fine balance between what you want to say as a brand, as, as a person or as a community, vis-a-vis -vis what someone else is looking out for, right? They're looking for something, they're searching for some content, they're looking for some information. And you obviously want to have your point of view and share your inputs and your thoughts. If you can find the balance between these two, that's really, you know, adding value to whoever's out there in my view. I'm sure the others might also have some insights around this. Right. So, um, is there any comments on anything from the other panelists? Please feel free to share that with the attendee because we are going towards um, the wrapping up. So, before that, I'd like to um, you know ask you if you have anything else to say as input or you know recommendations to the attendee. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wonderful yeah, session. Uh, wonderful session, and I think the questions were quite intriguing. And good that we answered all the questions. <laughs> Hopefully, yes, yes. yes. It's like no petting chat. <laughs> yeah, it's no, it's like old age examination. <laughs> yeah. When your parents used to ask, have you done everything? <laughs> we can say yes today. Right. Okay. So, Avilash, uh, do you have anything to say to that, Indy? Not specifically to this, but thanks for the great session. It was interesting to see all these questions and these perspectives. Okay, um, Abhishek, can I ask you to? Great session. Uh, thank you so much to, to you for being such a great moderator. Uh, very good questions. And uh, thanks to all the other panelists for uh, adding their value. It's always great to learn. Uh, my only uh, 
words would be to all the students like i said we are in a phase of lifelong learning uh, please please just pay attention to what i had said earlier learning will have to come from being dirtying your hands so yeah. i know covid is forcing us to be indoors uh, but there are many new opportunities coming up for things to to do and try just go out there and try there is there is always full marks for trying before you judge yourself absolutely absolutely right so um i shall go towards in that case i shall go towards wrapping up and then hand it over to avp uh thank you very much the panelists my you know heartfelt sincere thanks to you it has been a lively session very enjoyable for myself because you know i i got to listen to you uh, usually i don't get to do that so i got to listen to you enjoyed it immensely i hope the attendees have been benefited from what it was and i'll just say a few words before concluding that is as all the panelists have said that these digital marketing thing is extremely dynamic these are all the points that you can take home with you from this um webinar today it is very dynamic if you really want to get into it you have to get your hand dirty you have to work on it just reading something may not help number one number two it's a collection of skills so if you want to get into digital marketing you might be knowing a few things of which one or two is are your core competency and the others you are fairly good at thirdly um there are always always upgradation going on so treat yourself as uh, almost like a software get upgraded all the time whenever you can and assimilate it not just i know this but assimilate it because knowing the terms only knowing the terms wouldn't help and the final point most important is that you know i truly believe almost anyone from any discipline can come into digital marketing and any skill can be utilized in a digital marketing periphery like you know if you are in arts or humanities please consider yourself capable of doing a part of uh digital marketing if you think you are not please if but if you want to please check up with someone who knows i am very happy to help anyone out if they contact me individually and i'm sure the panelists will be do so engineers uh of course management professionals or science graduates anyone commerce graduates anyone because we have sme as we call them subject matter experts we have places for smes in all sorts of role in this and more so there is something you have to think out of the box now there are positions like innovation managers innovation designers insight directors you know things like that we have never heard of such jobs before now how does one become an insight director by by providing good insights what what are the requirements for being able to provide good insights so good thought process good understanding you know eyes for details that's all you need as all the panelists said whatever degree you have yeah it's relevant but it's not all that important unless you can prove yourself in that field even if you uh, you know take a very high end digital marketing qualification get into a job if you cannot get your hand dirty you cannot do anything at all you will have to leave that job better so it's better to learn and all the companies are more interested in what a person can do rather the rather rather than what a person has been trained to do you see so so basically uh, it's a polyglot culture the term polyglot is an ancient term it was utilized for people like michelangelo and leonardo da vinci who were not only artists but also engineers you know polyglot means mixing different disciplines so it is a polyglot culture 
and among those you have to specialize in the longer run on something so that is basically the idea with that i would like to hand over the control to app education and uh, thank you very much thank you panelists thank you app thank you attendees this has been a privileged and excellent experience for me thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.